President Obama after the hostage situation in France. Three terrorists with ties to Al Qaeda now dead, one still on the run. Chief White House correspondent Ed Henry is live tonight at the White House. Ed? Well, Megan, the bottom line is for the second straight day, the president tried to keep the focus on his upcoming State of the Union address. Today, talking in Knoxville, Tennessee, mostly about his new plan to expand access to community colleges uh, before a campaign-style crowd. The image is obviously a sharp contrast to what was playing out on the streets of Paris. Uh, and that situation got only a passing mention from the president at the top of his speech. Listen. We're hopeful that the immediate threat is now resolved. Uh, thanks to the courage and professionalism of the French personnel on the ground. But the French government continues to face the threat of terrorism and has to remain vigilant. The situation is fluid. Now, perhaps more interesting is what the president did not say. He did not list any specific steps he's taking to keep the American homeland safe. Uh, aides say, look, there's a lot more going on behind the scenes. The president has been getting virtually around-the-clock briefings, has convened a conference call in the last 24 hours with top national security officials to stay uh, on top of the situation, make sure this terror does not spread to America. Megan? Ed, thank you. Well, we noticed a remarkable contrast tonight in what we are hearing from some world leaders about radical Islam and the growing series of terror attacks around the globe uh, and what we're hearing domestically. First, some recent remarks from President Obama on the threat from the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. And one of those groups is ISIL, which calls itself the Islamic State. ISIL is not Islamic. We could go on, of course. Now listen to French President Hollande today on the attacks in France. We must not make any confusion concerning these terrorists and fanatics that have nothing to do with the Muslim religion. Earlier this week, however, after the original murders in Paris, uh, the, no, I think it was actually on New Year's Day. I'm not sure we have our date right on that. The president of Egypt made a remarkable statement about Islam and terror. Listen to this. It's inconceivable that the thinking that we hold most sacred should cause the entire Islamic world to be a source of anxiety, danger, killing, and destruction for the rest of the world. Impossible. That thinking, ideas that we have sacralized over the years, is antagonizing the entire world. It's antagonizing the entire world. Is it possible that 1.6 billion Muslims should want to kill the rest of the world's inhabitants? That is 7 billion, so that they themselves may live? Impossible. I say and repeat again that we are in need of a religious revolution. You Imams are responsible before Allah. The entire world is waiting for your next move because this Islamic world is being torn, it is being destroyed, it is being lost and it is being lost by our own hands. Extraordinary. Joining me now, Ann Coulter, best-selling author and conservative commentator. That is shocking. Stand up there and speak to a bunch of imams right. and talk about how, the, it's, it, how it's inconceivable. It's un inconceivable that the thinking most sacred to us should cause the entire Islamic world to be a source of anxiety, danger, killing, and destruction for the rest of the world. This thinking is antagonizing the entire world. Right. And um, of all the Muslim leaders in the world, this is the one that Obama does not like. Um, and didn't he's attack him because he took out. Sissy took out the Muslim Brotherhood. Right. That's why when Obama withdrew, you know, millions, maybe it was a billion dollars in aid, we were giving. And it isn't that I've heard a lot of people say that, um, you know, usually the Obama administration won't call any Islamic terrorism Islamic, but of course they had to here because it was so obvious. No, that isn't why Obama admitted it was Islamic terrorism. The socialist president of France admitted it. But he the did. Of he the did admit it. No, you're right. He, he said it was low. terrorism, but he wouldn't say it was Islamic terrorism. He did terrorism. have that, that part I love so much where we say it has nothing to do with the religion. Because right. I haven't heard that eight billion times already. I needed to hear it eight billion plus but, one. But here's the, the head of the let me, let me just set it up because, because when he remarked on this, President Obama the other day, right. he refused to call it Islamic terrorism, just terrorism, he said. And then he commented more today, and once again, he said nothing about Islamic radicalization, Islamic terrorism, radical Islam, nothing. And in fact, as the viewers know, back in 2010, his administration banned the term jihad, banned the term Islamic extremism from the central document outlining our national security strategy. They want to pretend that does not exist, apparently. Yes. Yeah. Why does this happen? Well, about 10% of their population 
is Muslim. Maybe maybe it would be better if they had immigrants that had a more similar background and who didn't respond to cartoons they don't like by by shooting people. I think that's the next step to but consider, but there, we can't Amy? consider. How do you get there? I mean, I, I, one wonders why these groups want to live in France. They don't want to assimilate. They don't, they don't want to live in Muslim countries. Culture. So, and yet they want to change the non-Muslim countries they move to to Muslim countries. So how do you figure that out? You know, when you get the visa application, how do you figure out whether somebody wants to be a part of your culture or does not? Um, well, it may be a small minority, as the president um, and, and the president of France keep reminding us this is not the majority of Muslims, um, yet and still it's enough of them that maybe you take a little pause in Muslim immigration for a while. Right now it is not true, as another um, politically correct uh, conventional wisdom I've been hearing over and over again on TV as well. Our Muslims are different. We get a different brand. And we're so much better at assimilating. I'm sorry, have you been to the United States of America? We assimilate no one. The difference is we have a population that is less than 1% Muslim. It's almost 10% in France. Do not act like Muslims have not been continuing to commit terrorist attacks since 9-11. I mean, right here in Times Square, the Boston um, Marathon, the, the, the Fort Hood, two attacks there. There have been about 60 attacks since 9-11. So yeah, okay, that's not the majority of them, but it's more than ta the terrorism we're getting from, say, British immigrants. Mm -hmm. But what difference would it make if we started calling it what it is? You know what I mean? The, the, the label, does, it, does the label matter? If President Obama said what Sissy said, well, what difference would it for make? For one thing, he might not have withdrawn American funding from Sissy. Mm -hmm. There you have, you have the good guy coming in, taking out the Muslim Brotherhood, and Obama's nose is out of joint. No, get, elevate the good ones. Um, it also might make people reconsider mass immigration from the third world. Mm. Security Agency. Speaking at its London headquarters, Director General Andrew Parker warned Al-Qaeda terrorists in Syria are planning mass casualty attacks against the West, including the British transit system and iconic landmarks like Big Ben. Quote, we face a very serious level of threat that is complex to combat and unlikely to abate significantly for some time. My sharpest concern as Director General of MI5 is the growing gap between the increasingly challenging threat and the decreasing availability of capabilities to address it. Parker is referring to the growing number of seasoned Al-Qaeda members in Syria, many with ties to Osama bin Laden, known as the Khorasan Group. They include Sanafi al Nasser and Mousin al-Fadli. In an exclusive interview with the Fox Business Network, the NSA director said Paris shows how the followers of radical Islam think, then act. I didn't need to, you know, use targeted violence or indiscriminate violence as a vehicle to help perpetuate this viewpoint of others. That's not a good development for us. That certainly increases the challenge from an um, intelligence perspective. Boy, that makes life a whole lot harder. And tonight, the State Department issuing a new warning to U.S. citizens overseas that the attacks against Americans are increasing and the risk of retaliation for U.S. airstrikes against ISIS in Iraq and Syria is credible. Megan? Catherine Herridge, thank you. Joining me now with more insurgency and counterterrorism, including against Al-Qaeda. He's worked for U.S. Special Operations and is also the director of the International Security and Defense Policy Center at Rand Corp, a global think tank that advises the U.S. military. Seth, good to see you tonight. And this morning, according to General Keene, that we've now received from Andrew Parker, uh, the head of MI5, he said that it's extraordinary, that it's highly unusual. This is a very private man. He's not out there normally like the head of the FBI or the, or the head of the CIA is here. And he's trying to tell us something. There's a reason he's gone public with this. Your thoughts on it? Well, Megan, uh, past MI5 directors, including Andrew Parker, the current one, rarely speak publicly, maybe once a year, maybe not even once a year. So the fact that he's come out now after an attack which in France, which looks like it has connections back to Yemen, uh, is important for several reasons. One is it's, an, it's a statement that there is a major threat to the West. It's also a statement, and this goes back to your comments earlier, uh, that this is more than just Yemen. There's a bigger global issue here, because he was referring particularly to the Khorasan group in Syria. He also mentioned the attacks we've seen in Canada, Australia, threats against the United States, and across Europe, including in Belgium. 
So we are almost in an unprecedented position right now where we've got these smaller kinds of attacks in multiple areas of the globe. And part of it, uh, he's highlighting that this is not going to stop any time in the near future. You're a counterterrorism guy. General Keene was talking about the need to get Muslim leaders and others out there to identify what this really is and try to discuss it and be honest about it and combat it. But in the meantime, while the ideology is rampant, and you tell me, is it more rampant now than ever? And if so, why? What should we be doing? Well, I think where, where the ideology is more rampant, or at least is more accessible uh, now than in, in previous eras, including five to ten years ago, is the ability of some of these extremist organizations to get their messages out on social media and to use social media, Twitter, MySpace, YouTube, uh, Facebook, to get the messages out. So it has reached more people, I think, than we have ever seen, and, the, and, and into homes in the United States obviously in Paris, in London, and that's, that's a difference. The ability to reach people in any of our countries is different than what we've seen in the past. How about, what, but what do we do about it? I mean, you're trying to fight this as a counterinsurgency measure. What do we need right. to do? Do we, know, do, do we need, to go, need to go full NSA? You know, I mean, restore everything that, that was modified after Edward Snowden and the leaks? What? Well, I, I, th there are a couple of things. One is uh, that our intelligence services, both overseas and uh, at home have got to be on this. And what, what, one of the lessons that comes out of this uh, French series of attacks is that when you look at somebody, and we saw this in Boston because the Tsarnaevs were looked at at one point, the F FBI interviewed mm -hmm. uh, one of the Tsarnaevs and didn't, it doesn't appear, went back and took a look at him carefully. When we go through people in the United States, assess that they may be a threat two or three years ago, we've got to come back and look at some of these people two or three years down the road today. Maybe they weren't a threat two or three years ago, but are they a threat today? And that Civil means we've got to be able to do that. Yeah, well, well, but if, if they're plotting attacks, we've got to, you know, we, we still have to be on that. Seth, glad you're on our side. Thank you. <laughs> ...on the massive manhunt now underway in France for a female terror suspect. She is the alleged accomplice of the gunman that police killed earlier today after he took more than a dozen people hostage at a kosher market in Paris. Trace Gallagher has the very latest. Trace. Megan, her name is 26-year-old Hayette Boumdien. She was the wife of the man who took and killed hostages inside that kosher market. Boumdien reportedly married him after he got out of prison for armed robbery, though because it was not a civil ceremony, the marriage isn't recognized under, under French law. Boumdien, who went from posing in a bikini to never being seen without a veil, once worked as a cashier and told police she quit her job for Islam and that it was her husband who radicalized her, saying she was inspired by him to read books on religion and that she views America as the ultimate evil, saying, quote, when I saw the massacre of the innocents in Palestine, in Iraq, Chechnya, Afghanistan, or anywhere else, the Americans send their bombers, all that, well, who are the terrorists? Police say in just the past year, Boom Dien made 500 phone calls to the wives of the Kouachi brothers, the men behind the massacre at the Charlie Hebdo newspaper, and that Boom Dien, her husband, and the Kouachis often traveled together, including a visit to the home of a known Al-Qaeda terrorist who's serving 10 years in a French prison. Police believe they were all working together to orchestrate the Paris attacks. Boom Dien was first thought to have been inside the kosher market with her husband, now, prosecutors tell our Greg Palcott that she was not inside. Mm. Thank you. Trace, thank you. Tonight, with the very latest on the terrorist ties to Al Qaeda, Fox's own uh, Catherine Herridge is standing by. Catherine. Sean, the U.S. intelligence and counterterrorism community are considering the credibility of a claim of responsibility from Al Qaeda in Yemen in a five minute video message in Arabic called The Blessed Raid in Paris. Earlier today, before the takedown at this industrial park on the outskirts of Paris, 32-year-old Sharif Kouachi told a French TV station that he was Al-Qaeda, quote, I was sent, me, Sharif Kouachi, by Al-Qaeda of Yemen. I went over there, and it was Anwar Al-Alaki who financed me. The American-born cleric Al-Alaki ran the external plotting for Al-Qaeda in Yemen before he was killed in a CIA drone strike in September 2011. Separately, U.S. government sources told Fox News they also believe the 34-year-old brother, Saeed Kouachi, went to Yemen earlier that same year and trained with or fought alongside al-Qaeda in Yemen. Fox News is told Saeed Kouachi wanted to meet with the al-Qaeda leadership. 
Eyewitnesses at Wednesday's massacre at Charlie Hebdo said the two brothers claimed they were al-Qaeda and in one instance specified al-Qaeda in Yemen. Shortly after the massacre, a series of tweets went up from a Twitter account linked to al-Qaeda in Yemen. They show images of the shooting with photos of al-Awlaki and another American, Samir Khan, who was killed in a CIA drone strike. Khan was the driving force behind the group's online propaganda magazine that called for the cartoonist assassination. Tonight, the FBI and the Homeland Security Department have issued a joint intelligence bulletin warning the Paris massacre is a departure from recent lone wolf Islamic terrorist attacks because it showed premeditation and terrorist training. Sean? All right, Catherine Herridge in Washington tonight. Thank you. And joining us now to detail how the two tense hostage situations in France and director of Jihad Watch, Robert Spencer. Uh, for, in terms of the operation, uh, Danny, let's just talk about this simultaneously. With us, we weren't at war with them. Ex immigrants in France and all over Europe are unprecedented. There has never been in the history of the world before large scale immigration of a people from one place to another with a ready made model of society and governance that they consider to be superior to the model of the place to which they are coming. They have no interest in integration, no interest in assimilation. All from one place to another with a ready-made model of society and governance that they consider to be superior. Those were missed, just like with the 9-11 Commission report. They were at war with us. We weren't at war with them. Explain how, is, how Islamists have like a separate society. Muslims have a separate society from the rest of France. Absolutely, Sean. Look, the, the Muslim immigrants in France and all over Europe are unprecedented. There has never been in the history of the world before large-scale immigration of a people from one place to another with a ready-made model of society and governance that they consider to be superior to the model of the place to which they are coming. They have no interest in integration, no interest in assimilation. All they want to do is Islamize and transform the society that they are coming to. So in France they have set up the, the French government lists on a public website, 751 no-go areas is where essentially the police have no authority, the French state has no authority, and Islamic law prevails. These places are incubators. Of it almost reminds Islamic me of like, it's sort of like Israel. They're allowing themselves to be surrounded. Now you say, why then, if they don't want to assimilate to Western culture, which their value system is the antithesis, it's freedom of speech and expression and religion, etc. If they don't want to assimilate to that, why do they even go there? Is it because they want? Is this part of a desire for worldwide domination in this caliphate? Sean, it is. I mean, that's what they want. Emigration is a core Islamic principle. The idea of the hijra, the flight from Mecca to Medina, where Muhammad for the first time became a political, military, and as well as a spiritual leader, and began to conquer Arabia from there. That sanctified in Islam the idea of emigrating to a new place to conquer and Islamize it, and that's exactly what we're seeing. So the idea is, the, the, those that are radical Islamists, they want to integrate this worldwide, so they move to other areas, and rather than assimilate, their goal is to indoctrinate and proselytize and, if necessary, through force change. Absolutely. They set up these Sharia enclaves, and then because their birth rate is so much higher than that of the non-Muslim population, those enclaves will inevitably grow and continue to grow until finally that's all there is. Danny Colson, from a law enforcement standpoint, as a former FBI uh, deputy assistant director, <clears throat> Do you agree with that assessment? And if that's true, how, do, how does the Western world stop that? Well, I think that's about the best assessment I've ever heard of the problem. That was a great job. Well, what you've done there is you've allowed a lot of cancer to come inside your country. It's almost like the Vietnam term, they're inside the wire. That's where you don't want them. And it uh, greatly inhibits uh, law enforcement to, uh, to conduct investigations there. If you can't go there, how do you investigate 
uh, terrorism. You can't do it. I, th I think it's a bad situation, and it seems like it's about time to me that uh, France took their country back. I can't even imagine having a force inside your country that you do not control. That's just All right, so wait a minute. So if France has six and a half million Muslims, 10% of the population, estimates vary a little bit, a million here or there. Uh, Okay, you say take back your country, what does that mean? That either you allow us into these areas, you allow our police in, you don't have non-Muslim zones where, where non-Muslims aren't allowed or no-go zones? You're saying that all of a sudden they're going to change that? What's going to happen if they try to? I don't think they're going to change it all of a sudden, but I think they cannot let it extend. Um, Sean, we're in a war. And we have to fight a war like it's a war. And if we have the enemy inside the gates, I think you address it through law enforcement, through the military, whatever it takes to get your country back. I can't even imagine a situation like that and how difficult it would be to control your country. And sooner right, or later, so they're going to lose control of it. 751 no-go zones. What, are we going to go in all of a sudden and say, I'm sorry, we're policing now? Well, and here's the question. Is this happening in the United States? Yes, it is. It's on a much yes. large, a much smaller scale, of course. In Explain. The United States, because the Muslim population of the United States is much smaller. We have no-go zones in the United States? Well, you know, in, in the United States, you have more, you have the, those camps way out in the country. At least 35 have been documented, where mm -hmm. they are essentially like those no-go zones, but they're not in urban areas and in concentrated places. What are you talking about specifically? I'm talking about... Michigan? Places I'm sorry? Mich areas in Michigan? What? Yeah, sure, Michigan, but uh, I'm talking about rural areas, New York, Georgia, South Carolina, California, places that are way out and remote. You have these Islamic enclaves where the same kind of situation prevails. There was, uh, there was some disturbances at some of them in Texas not uh, uh, last year, and uh, the police showed the same hesitation about going in that they show in France. All right, guys, thank you both. Appreciate it. All right, when we come back... Thank you. Welcome back to Hannity. Today, moments after the three suspected terrorists in France had been killed, French President Holland, he addressed the people, and this is what he said. I should refute any easy conclusion. Those who have committed those acts, uh, those fanatics, uh, have nothing to do with Islam. Nothing to do with Islam. Joining me now with Reaction Blue Force Tracker Editor and former U.S. Air Force Special Ops Pilot Nolan Peterson is with us. From the Heritage Foundation, Niall Gardner is with us and Act for America President uh, and Terrorism Analyst Brigitte Gabriel. Uh, we heard this from the President. ISIS is not Islamic. Uh, it, it's almost like knee-jerk at this point. Uh, ISIS is Islamic. In their 10-page document, they mention Islamic verses 26 times. Uh, so he cannot say it is not Islamic. And who gave them the expertise to talk on behalf of Islam? They don't even uh, read the Quran in Arabic. And it all started with President Bush, Sean. President Bush immediately after September 11 said, Islam is a religion of peace. Uh, so did uh, uh, Tony Blair. They did not know what they were talking about, and they misled their population. Submission. Listen. Submission. Islam. The, the word in Arabic is Islam. Islam is submission. Salam is peace. But a lot of West because the two words sound very similar, Islam and Salam, they think Salam is peace. And it is very wrong. It is submission to Islam and nothing else. You know, if you look around the world, Nile, you know, we can look at America, France, we can look at Great Britain, Nigeria, Mali, uh, Libya, Kenya, Somalia, Yemen, Iraq, Iran, Syria, Pakistan, Afghanistan. I, I can't even name all the countries. Violence in the name of Islam. And yet there's this denial constant non-stop denial why well that's a very good point i think that uh, francois Hollande, the french president is in a complete uh, state of denial with his statements earlier today the same goes for president obama and the deadly threat that the west faces today is driven by islamist extremism it is religiously motivated uh, violence it is the greatest uh, threat of our generation and we really need to rise up to the challenge. Unfortunately, Mr. Hollande clearly is not up to the task. In many ways, France has become a basket case under his socialist rule. And we need strong, robust leadership on both sides of the Atlantic. Unfortunately, uh, with uh, Mr. Hollande and President Obama, they're both politicians in a deep state of denial. And this is a war that we simply have to win. We cannot win this war with policies of appeasement.
Yeah, no one are, isn't the world in a state of denial and that there's there's very few people that seem willing to just state what is an obvious truth, especially on the left. I mean, I can name two people that will take that position. Well, I think what President Hollande said was was naive, but I also have a different take on what he was trying to say. I don't think he was necessarily addressing French Muslims. I think the French the French president recognizes that his country is on the brink of cultural collapse. Wait, so in other he's, words, he's maybe afraid that, that the 751 no-go zones have now, that if they come out against this, that this is going to create an outright war in their society, a cultural conflict? Is that is that what he's saying? He's afraid to say that? What, what I think... He's afraid to do from, what the cartoonists were not afraid to do? Well, aside from the rise of the threat of Islamic terrorism in Europe, there's also the rise of far-right, ultranationalist political parties like the Front National who are very violent and who are known to be anti-Semitic and they even apologize for the Nazis and so what I think what along you, you cannot compare the two you cannot compare the two you have to understand that we are fighting Islamic radicalism worldwide Islamic radicalism is with leadership weak leadership on the part of America or Britain or France or Germany or any Western nation how do we have a chance of winning this war we what? are fighting a cancer growing within our midst and people in Western nations need to develop the backbone to stand up and fight this is what made the West great Westerners and Western civilization became great nations and great civilization because of the strength, because of the intelligence, and because of the tolerance and love. But tolerance does not mean we let people walk all over us. Tolerance does not mean we surrender. America, last time I checked, was the home of the braves. This is the time we need all to come together as Western nations because we are all attacked by Islamic radicalism. They hate us all regardless of what passport we hold, regardless what our skin color, regardless what language or what accent we speak, whether we speak Swedish, we Francais, or whether we speak English, we are a target and the, all of the West needs to come together, throw political correctness in the garbage, and fight to win this war. All right, but appreciate I agree. All. <laughs> I appreciate you all for being with us. Thank you, Brigitte. Good to see you. And coming up next Thank tonight, you. on a busy news night tonight on Hannity. Ever since the president took office, he has been underestimating the threats as posed by radical Muslims. And just last month, the commander-in-chief, he released more than a dozen Gitmo detainees. On December 20th, for example, four terrorists were released from Gitmo. Among them, Mohammed Zahir, a high-level member of the Taliban. Then you have Abdul Ghani. He allegedly helped transfer and plant landmines and other explosive devices for use against two U.S. forces. Then on December 30th, while you were getting ready to celebrate the new year, five more terrorists were freed from Gitmo. Among them, Adel Hakimi, who's reportedly a senior member of the Global Jihadist Support Network, that former advisor to Osama bin Laden. These are all evil people. Here with reaction now, Fox News military analyst, Lieutenant Colonel Bill Cowan, and the co-host of Outnumbered, our friend Andrea Tanteros. You lived in France for a year. I did. Yeah. I did. I studied in France. I speak fluent French. And 15 years ago, mm -hmm. I wrote my dissertation in French essentially predicting that this would happen Explain. on the rise of Islam. Because France has former colonies, as you know, as your guests have pointed out, in Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco, that immigrated Sean into the country in the 1960s and 70s. And those older generations have assimilated very well, but it is their children. It is their children. The unemployment rate for youth in France is above 20%. They don't have work. They are angry, they're caught between two societies, and they're very ripe to be uh, radicalized. And they can travel back and forth and get this kind of training with the visas. It's very dangerous, and that multicultural fantasy land that many of the socialists in France live in, and that our own president lives in, has allowed them to grow and to foster. So France, Sean, is essentially a powder keg. This will happen again there, and they have no hope to try and eradicate these no-go zones or this rise of Islam. They can only hope to contain it, if at best they can even do that. I mean, this situation it may is be so too dire. Late. I do think it's too late. I think I, the I demographics... Think it's too late. It may even be too late for Europe. The de it, bingo. The demographics yes. are not in Europe's favor, Sean, because the Europeans, while they sit around and drink wine and have only one child, 
the Muslims are having four, five, six children. Let me put this up on the screen, children. some demographic data as it goes to Europe in general here, because I think this is very important. This is, very Belgium important. has a problem. Great Britain has a problem. A lot of countries have a problem. Right now, the current number, the Muslim population in Europe, you got 44, well, no, that's in France, 44.1 uh, million, which is 6% of the population. All right, and then you have the projected number of Muslims living in Europe by 2030, 15 years from now, that's 58.2, which would be 8% of the population. Now, here, here's what I don't, you basically have a, a, a clash of civilizations, Colonel Cowan. You have those that want to, people to submit, Muslim and non-Muslim, to Sharia, or be killed, you know, convert or die, and then you've got people that believe in freedom. How, how can you possibly live in harmony with those divergent views. Sean, I, I think Andrea is exactly right. I think it's too late for France, and it's, it's, it's mm -hmm. too bad. It's, uh, you know, denial by design over there, our own president and their president, denial by design of what we're dealing with and maybe thinking somehow we can contain it. It's wishful thinking. It's wishing away the, the, the reality of the war that we are engaged in. Fortunately, here in the United States, almost all of our Muslim populations have assimilated, and we've given them opportunity to do things. But that doesn't mean we're not going to have problems over here. But as long as the problems are on that side, let, let's hope they stay on that side but the problem, and not come this way. But if the Muslim population worldwide is 1.6 billion, which is the estimate, okay. And you got 300, 400 million that support this radicalized view. That's a lot of people that are waging jihad on the rest of society. That's right. And they have the gut and, and the guts and the wherewithal, Sean, to fight this out because they believe and they've been fighting this for hundreds of years. They know in their hearts that the West doesn't have the guts to fight this as much as they do. You have to think about this. They put they put fighting these radical Muslims above all else. They believe that it is their mission to uh, so either convert or be killed. Period. End of story. So, so here is, I guess, the philosophy. Of, of leftists, the liberal mindset, they want to accommodate, they believe in multiculturalism, even though we have disagreements, we'll all be able to disagree, but this is, this is not about agreement. Either you believe that people must live under Sharia and under their religious control, or you believe in liberty and freedom. These are, it's the antithesis of one another. But the naivete is in both parties. It's worse in the progressives, President Obama, but it also was in the Republican Party where you saw with George Bush, he actually believed, and his motives were good, that you can change and democratize, I think, a, a, a ethnic hatreds that have been around for hundreds of years. I don't but, agree but with that. But he did that. win the war. I mean, we did but win Sean, the war in Iraq. This, that's, a, that's a small thing. We've been fighting for thousands of years. I mean, you have to think about this. They will fight us to the end. And the demographics are in their favor. And the fact that President Obama gave a speech in Cairo, believing that he could give a speech and change their minds about change. their ideas about the West, is, is profoundly naive. I mean, this country does not understand the threat that we are up against. Uh, Colonel Cowan, I can't disagree with the word she's saying. I don't think, oh. after every incident, we, we throw up our hands. How did this happen? How did this happen? Okay, well, look at the 751 no-go zones and the fact that Muslims have been able to confiscate France's land and separate themselves from the entire society is mind-numbing to me. And the French well, allowed Sean, that I, to happen. I, I agree totally. I agree with you, with Andrea. Everything she's saying right. Listen, Sean, there's a great irony right now. Yeah. President Sisi of Egypt, a Muslim leader who lived under the Muslim Brotherhood for a year, is the only leader now that has stood up and said, we Muslims have a problem and it's up to us to straighten it out or the world and us will suffer. Well, it's a, we we're wasted play, our president we're gonna play that. Like that. You're so smart. Great dovetail into our next segment because we're going to play when we come back. And thank you both for being with us. Appreciate you uh, sharing the experience. You. And coming up with the increasing number of terrorist attacks. Well, our, our president should be a leader and he should be rallying this country to fight Islam. And uh, I, might, I may be just an old retired cop, but I'll tell you one thing. The obvious thing is we are at war with Islam because Islam's at war with us. And when you, when you look at when it comes into our borders, it is now up to law enforcement, the FBI, the intelligence task force that they put together. But really, the profiling's all done. The Muslims have profiled themselves. The mosque is the center of their life, their recruitment, their radicalization, their contacts. All you have to do is watch, surveil, wiretap uh, a mosque, document everybody that comes in and out. We do that to somewhere. every mosque in America. Yes. 
every mosque in america if you don't do it what do you think they're doing to us they will now we look like fools we are running from one terrorist attack to another trying to patch you know put our finger in the dike and that incident trying to clean that up and then go to the next one when you when you look at this you're supposed to prevent this we're not acting like the military does in afghanistan or iraq or syria we're actually taking the fight to the suspects there here in america now you have law enforcement with their hands tied behind their back waiting for the suspect to bring the fight to you that is no way to run law enforcement you know i gotta tell you you read the quran hold Holy war, jihad, infidels, etc. Read the thing. Don't you have the feeling, and when the coal was bombed, the embassies both were bombed, something was coming, something was happening. I feel it. I got that feeling it's come it's coming to New York too. I'm sorry to say it's gonna be back in New York. But again, they're recruiting through the internet. They're recruiting, and these two little punks there, I don't even like to mention their names, these two brothers, Ick and Ike there, whatever their name, they said they wanted to die in a blaze because under their beliefs, they believe the worst thing in the world is you're fighting someone who wants to die. They wanted to die. It's they came culture out. Isla uh, radical Islam is a culture of death. They came out blazing their guns at those hundreds of cops. And again, they had 80,000 military and cops that were there in, in, in France. They're going to say, and I guarantee you, they videotaped on their cell phone, Allah Baka, Baka Wu, whatever the hell they say. And I'm telling you right now, they're going to be, they're going to be, I don't care what they say, but they're going to be martyrs that they took on 80,000 oh, military guys and the police and it took 80,000 to take our sons of Allah. Here's the problem. Mark, I'm listening to what you're saying. I think the world is out of touch starting from the president on down. You say, okay, well, we've got to now profile mosques and Muslims in America because it's a clash of cultures. And you read the Quran, the Quran, if you read it, interpret it literally, you know what? I, I understand where radicals come from because they interpret it that way. You're, gonna, you're, as an, you're an Islamophobe, uh, you're bigoted, you're hateful. Meanwhile, everyone forgets what life is like in Muslim countries mm. for those under Sharia. Go try and practice your Christianity in Saudi Arabia or some of these countries. Um, why do we, why Sean, do we put up Sean, this double standard? Well, we, we, we're, we are going to follow political correctness to our grave. I mean, it's so important to be politically correct. Look, Islam has decided that Westerners must die, and they are projecting this onto these people that are, are recruitment uh, ripe to have this done, and they are sending them out. If we do not take the fight to them, the fight will come to us. Now, the profiling of mosques, well, we could do other things too. Why are we still allowing students, college students, to come to this country on visas from countries that support, hide, harbor, and finance terrorists? We are fools, and the longer we're fools, the more this is going to happen, and they are going to actually have free reign because they can do it anywhere they want, and we are just reactive, not proactive. I agree. And the majority of them say they do not condone terrorist attacks, like the one we saw in France this week, but where are the leaders who are actually speaking out? Where's their outrage? Well, the Egyptian president, El Sisi, well, he took a good first step. Take a look. <laughs> يدفع بالأمة دي بالكامل إن هي تبقى مصدر للقلق وللخطر والقتل والتدمير في الدنيا كلها يعني الواحد وستة من عشرة مليار حيقتلوا الدنيا كلها اللي فيها سبعة مليار عشان يعيشوا هم مش ممكن أنا بكلم بقول تاني إحنا محتاجين ثورة دينية Joining me now, the co-host of The Five, Bob Beckel, Pulitzer Prize-winning investigative reporter, Fox News contributor Judith Miller. Uh, Bob, you have always said, where, where are the moderate Muslim voices? Th this guy's life may now be on the line. Absolutely. I only wish your audience had a chance to see those words bigger, because this is the most seminal speech that's taken place in that region. This is the equivalent of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. This man stood in front of imams, including the head imam, and said, your religion, in essence, has been hijacked, and the world is turning against us. And if you want them to turn against us, are 1 billion, 6 billion Muslims going to defeat 7 billion people in this world? No. It's time for us to get it back. And you, and he pointed right to the imam, that imam said, your responsibility before Allah 
is to do this now that is the courage beyond courage beyond courage i mean i got i i'm just so excited about i can't tell you absolutely true and you know it was amazing you probably heard it on fox news because the mainstream media did not cover this speech nor did they cover another first president sisi's visit to a coptic church where he celebrated mass on january 7th which is the the date in which they and do he it. said very similar and he things said similar things and both of those remarkable events went uncovered yeah, the other thing i would say about too we remember when they first burned the coptic churches which was months ago he was the first one there to say we're going to rebuild this church right now i wonder though knowing the mind of the radicals um is this is he anwar sadat is he in danger now Oh, sure. Yeah, of course he it. is. Yeah, of yeah. sure he is. But at least it's a fine Egyptian tradition of doing brave, courageous things that will help your people and help the world and be I read Sadat's autobiography years ago, and I got to tell you, he literally waited and waited and waited till his time, knowing that he wanted to bring about significant change, and as we all know, didn't end well in the Listen, end. Listen, I think CC understands that completely. This, this is a country that is, it, it, you go right through from Sadat, others have been uh, the bravest of brave who come out of Egypt. We better we saw the more oppressive have too, but I'm curious to see whether some other leader of a, of a Muslim state will step forward now. The most logical one would be the Saudis, who were most threatened by ISIS. But will they do that? I the doubt. Saudis have been no. duplicitous all these I years. Could, I couldn't agree with you. I'm just saying it would be nice to see it. The Iranians are the ones who really have it on the neck. Wait, 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 wait. About it? Just, just this very day, a guy got a thousand lashes. In, because he spoke out against the prophet right. well, in Saudi Arabia. Well, he only got Arabia. 50 of the thousand. He's okay. going to get the rest of them as time right. goes on. All right, so well, it's true, they practice the most radical and restrictive interpretation of Islam, so they don't want a revolution. They don't want what Sisi has called for. They'll oppose I, it. I, I don't, I, you know what, the silence, though, of imams, even in this country, has been rather deafening to me. Yeah, yeah, there are some that we've had on, in fairness, but those numbers are limited. Yeah, the question you have to ask we keep bringing the same it, people it, back. The because fundamental question here is, I, I can only draw two conclusions. Either one, they agree with what's going on, well, they're or afraid. two, they're cowards. And I think, frankly, most of them are cowards because they say what goes on and they're worried about getting killed. Well, if you're in a religious leader, you have to put your neck on the line sometimes. Why? And, because this is evil in our time. It could be thousands are getting slaughtered in the name of a religion, and it's getting worse every day, and it's impacting every continent. And one of the world's biggest and greatest religions historically, and it's been, impact, it's been taken over by a bunch of radical thugs yeah. who have no interest in the Quran, they have interest in killing and controlling and doing a Last word, Judith, we gotta go. I think that is the problem. It is up to, it is not up to us to reform Islam. It's up to Muslims who must stand up now and be counted and say, these people do not speak for us. Right, it's incumbent well upon them to do that. Appreciate it. All right, Bob Beckel, you beat out Howard Dean. Does it matter whether these people are Al-Qaeda, ISIS, Boko Haram, or any other insane group? They are all killing people in the name of Islam. But as Talking Points reported last night, rather than confront the jihad, many people, including President Obama, are doing everything they can to avoid the central issue. How do you defeat Muslim terrorism? Instead, we constantly hear this kind of stuff. We stand for freedom and hope and the dignity of all human beings. And that's what the city of Paris represents to the world. We have to acknowledge, and Muslims indeed do acknowledge, that there is a legitimate problem uh, within Islam. But at the same time that we acknowledge that there is a real issue here of extremism within this vast religion, I think we have to be very, very careful not to engage in religious profiling and to recognize that, you know, one can't blame 1.6 million adherents of this vast and complex religion. Now we ask Mr. Kristoff there, who writes for the New York Times, to appear with us. He will not because he's afraid. He's scared. He is one of the chief apologists for Islam throughout the world. As soon as the mass murder took place on Wednesday, Kristoff turned out a column saying, in essence, don't blame the Muslims. No, no, no. At this point, everybody knows that blaming all Muslims for terrorism is stupid and wrong. But even more foolish is the world looking away from the continuing threat. Maybe Mr. Kristoff and other left-wing media should address this question. Why is there no coordinated strategy to defeat the jihad after all this time? And that's a memo.
Now for Top Story Night, let's go to Paris, France, with Fox News correspondent Amy Kellogg. Dr. Zudi Jasser, the president of the American Islamic Forum for Democracy. So, you're a good guy, all right? I like you. You've been on this program, you're honest, you're clear thinking, you're an American patriot, you do good things um, because you're a doctor and because you are uh, an honest man. I think, thank you, I think you're going to pay a personal price. I think people have had enough uh, with, the, with the Muslims. I'm getting letters all over the place. It's wrong. It's, it's, it's muddled thinking. But I think it's going to happen, Doc. Well, Bill, you know, it takes sometimes uh, uh, some tough medicine for us to wake up, and I've been taking this risk. Many Muslims do, and ultimately, short of the violence, I, I, I pray there's no violence against Muslims, but we need urgency. We need fire under our feet. We've been given a pass. There's been denial, and ultimately, the best thing that can happen to Muslims and Islam is to defeat Islamism, to defeat not only ISIS, but all Islamic states. The pool that's creating these radicals right now now, the, the war so-called against terrorism is a whack-a-mole program because it's being created. The, the product is coming out of a much bigger problem, which is a large political movement where the Islamists believe their states are better than secular states. I, as a former naval officer, Bill, would die for America, would die for liberty. The jihadists would die for the Islamic State. That's how we need to All figure right. out who the good guys well, here, are. Here, here's the problem. We have the president of uh, Egypt and we have the president of Bahrain, both coming out and saying, you know, we're going to get the jihadists. We have the king of Jordan. He's a Muslim. He's going to get the jihadists, too. So that's three. But then you have the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, our big ally. They let the Wahhabists run wild. You got Pakistan, we've already discussed it. Disgusting country, revolting country, imprisoning the man who got bin Laden for us. Turkey, Turkey, all right? Wouldn't even give us the support. They didn't even have to do anything. Just let us land our planes so we can get out ISIS. No. You see, now this is the stuff that people aren't going to make the differential. They're going to go, Muslims, we don't want to hear about them anymore. In Europe, you're seeing all the thousands of people. It's anti-Muslim demonstrations, not anti-jihadists. Well, because the lens that we're looking at this has been wrong. Remember, all those countries you listed are still part of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. They still did not sign the UN Declaration of Human Rights. They signed the Cairo one based on Sharia law. To this date, during the Cold War bill, we had hundreds of researchers studying in the Pentagon, State Department, Soviet war theory, communist war theory. Today, we won't study Sharia. Islamic law is not being discussed as the instrument of political Islam. While some some of these dictators may be better than others. What you're not hearing from the LCCs of the world, yes, they're getting upset with the populist Islamists, but as dictator tribal Islamists, they still feed from the same pool. What they're not saying is countering liberty, is, is, is building liberty, freedom, they don't democracy. Believe in it. Don't believe well, it. they don't, exactly. Well, what, what brought America was the defeat of theocracy, of the Tom Paines, the Thomas Jeffersons. Yeah, I that, mean, that, that, that was part of it. But, but they don't believe, the, the leaders in most of these uh, Muslim nations don't believe in freedom. They don't believe that the masses have the education for it. We're not going to change that, but we have to get them to fight the jihad. Doctor, we appreciate your point of view. As always, you might want to check out the doctor's book called The Battle for the Soul of Islam. Very interesting read. And when we come right back, Geraldo is continuing at this hour for a suspected female accomplice to the deadly hostage situation at a Paris supermarket. And while her whereabouts are currently unknown, we are learning much more about the men behind the initial attack on the Charlie Hebdo magazine. It turns out one of these guys called a French TV station just before he and his brother were killed in a shootout with police earlier today. Watch the subtitles on the bottom of your screen. Je te dis juste qu'on est les défenseurs du prophète sallallahu alayhi wa sallam et, euh, et que j'ai été envoyé moi à Shérif Kouachi par Al-Qaïda du Yémen et que je suis parti là-bas et que c'est Shir Anwar Al-Aulaqi qui m'a financé. Rahimahullah. Et c'était il y a combien de temps à peu près euh, Ça fait longtemps avant qu'il soit tué. Que Allah le fasse miséricorde. Our next guest has spent years tracking the spread of radical Islam across Europe. 
Soren Kern is a distinguished senior fellow with the Gatestone Institute, a global think tank that focuses on radical Islam. Soren, thank you very much for being here tonight. Let's start with thank the radicalization me. problem that is clearly an issue in Paris, but not just Paris. It's gone well beyond that. How did it get so bad? Well, the situation has been festering for many years. Um, it's a question of um, mass immigration to European countries. It's a, it's a combination of multiculturalism. It's been permitted to come to this situation um, um, largely because um, European governments are trying to create these multicultural societies and they're trying to um, blend the Muslim populations into the secular or secular Western Christian, Judeo-Christian populations and um, in theory, the practice works okay, I guess, but in, in practice, what we're seeing is that it doesn't work at all. And, um, but but how does that jive with what we've seen in France? Because we've been talking about how in France there are these ghettos outside of the, uh, the city of Paris, and this is where these Muslims stay, they, these radicalized Muslims, and they don't integrate with French society, and they have sort of a, um, a sister society going uh, outside the outskirts of Paris where they're having their own schooling and Sharia law. So how does that jive with what you just said about how they're trying to force integration and it's failing? Yes, there are a lot of internal contradictions in, in multiculturalism. Multiculturalism in practice works a lot different. It, instead of integrating um, immigrants and making it a great great big multi, melting pot like in the United States, in Europe what is happening with multiculturalism is really a segregation. And so that Muslims, they live in their neighborhoods and in their um, barrios um, all across the continent, and they're segregated from the rest of society, and they are not expected to learn the language. They're not expected to integrate into the society. They're allowed to create their own Sharia courts. They're allowed to have their own jurisprudence. Um, they're allowed to continue with um, all of the customs that they're accustomed to, for example, with polygamy and female genital mutilation, and all of these sorts of things are tolerated under multiculturalism in Europe. Do you think that's about to change? I mean, what we heard today, and we're going to play some of this next, but you know, the, the French president was talking about how what we saw has, has nothing to do with Islam. Well, I thought that this might be a turning point where it might get the attention of the European elites that this multicultural um, multiculturalism is leading to a disaster for Europe. But when I heard the French president um, de-link what has happened in France over the past couple of days from Islam, um, it makes me believe that this actually may not be a turning point at all. Um, it really depends on if there are more copycat incidents like this, if there are other attacks in other parts of Europe. Um, but it seems to me this, there's, a, there's a resistance among the European elites to really call Islam what it is and to link a lot of this radicalism to the basic documents and doctrines of Islam. Which, and until that happens, it seems to me um, this is going to continue. What, what, and what's amazing is that while they're refusing to do it, the Egyptian president has now done it. Soren, thank you for being here. We'll call on you again. Thank you. Well, while the American president and the French president are saying this week's terror attack had nothing to do with Islam, we are hearing such a different message from the president of Egypt. Egypt!